Hi folks, it's me again with another video on partial fractions. So last time, this is where we left off. We'd solved a single partial fraction decomposition. We looked at two different methods for solving it. And just to recap those two methods uh, for solving, you can either do what we call uh, equating coefficients, which is looking at the two things and then use those to make a system. Now that's usually more work because you do have to create then a system and solve it with elimination or something like that. Uh, then the other method is plugging in these like smart X values, um, which is seems awesome, but it doesn't always work out. Sometimes an X you pick will cause the entire equation to zero out, uh, for example. Uh, that's what's going to happen in the problem down below. So we're like, actually, sometimes you have to make a system. You have to be able to do it one way number one. And then if you can do it in way number two, that's just like bonus icing. But it's not going to work all the time. Uh, all right. So now I want to attack a situation that we call a repeated linear factor situation. So don't think about this as a quadratic factor, even though it's got a degree two. Think about it more like a double root. Here's how you're going to set up something if you have a repeated linear factor. You're going to, again, set up your two fractions. The bottom of the first fraction oh, is just going to have x plus 1 to the first. The bottom of the second fraction is going to have x plus 1 to the second power. And then on the top of each fraction, you're just going to put, again, some coefficients like a and b. Now, why do you have to do this? Why can't we just split it up in, uh, or like, why do we even have to split this up? Well, if I scroll back to the very top, where we did an example of adding fractions, notice that in this example of two fractions that were added together, I had a different coefficient on top of the x plus one compared to the x plus one squared. And both of those things played into our final answer. So they were both important uh, and they could potentially be different. So now we're, let's carry through this problem. I set it up. Um, when we learn about quadratic factors that are irreducible, you're gonna to start to say like, why don't we do something else out here? Why don't we do bx plus c? Uh, well, the reason is because this is still really is just a linear factor, it's degree one factor. So all you do is put a b on top of it there. Okay, so how do we set this up? Well, the first move I would do is again, like before, think about multiplying the entire equation by x plus one, x plus one. That's going to clear out every fraction. So what's going to clear out? Well, in the first one, that entire thing will clear out. In the second B value, that entire thing will clear out. And in the A value, one of those will clear out and one of them will remain. So let's kind of rewrite that out. So it's going to be X equals A X plus one plus B. Okay. Uh, now let's think about this. I could substitute a value in for x at this point. If x was equal to negative 1, what happens? I would get negative 1 equals a times negative 1 plus 1 plus b. And that would tell me that negative 1 would equal to a times 0 plus b. And negative 1 would equal b. So I guess I was wrong before. Uh, it does turn out that plugging in a smart value of x can help you here. Uh, but for example, I can't plug in a second value of x and figure out what uh, a is because there's no things over here attached to b. So I can't actually zero out the b term. Um, oh, I can erase my a, that's confusing. Um, but what I can do is use what I found for b and uh, rewrite this out so I can say, um, x, well, no. So if I substitute that value negative one in for b here, uh, I don't immediately get an answer um, because that's not how this works usually, uh, but I do have something I can work with. So if I substitute negative one in, I get x equals ax plus one minus one. I can add one to both sides and I can also distribute the a. And now I can look at the parallel structure. So if I have one x plus one equals ax plus a, parallel structure says that a had darn well better equal one. So now I found both a and b, and I can rewrite the answer. So the answer is going to be uh, a was one, so I'll write it as one over x plus one. 
uh, plus negative one over x plus one quantity squared. And that would be like a final answer for uh, this partial fraction decomposition. Here's another example of a special case or a situation that you might encounter. Uh, say in a fraction that I have a denominator of uh, x squared plus one. Now, x squared plus one does not factor. Well, at least over the real numbers it doesn't factor. It would factor into x plus i and x minus i, which is not a helpful thing when we're trying to decompose something over the real numbers. So this is an example of an irreducible irreducible quadratic factor on the bottom. Now, if you think about uh, taking this and making it into a fraction, there's a lot of different things that could be on this denominator. There could, of course, be a number like a three, but there could also be an x term. So I could, for example, have four x plus three on top. And because this x is degree one and this x is degree two, this would still count as like a proper fraction as simplified as it could go. So if we're setting up a partial fraction decomposition and I see a factor like this on the bottom that's an irreducible quadratic and I've tried to factor it and it doesn't factor, then when I set this up, I need to account for both the possibility of a number and the possibility of a variable with an x coefficient. So here's how that sets up. Um, Again, I have an actual problem to look at. I'm not gonna solve this problem. Uh, for example, I think often in your book, it will just tell you to write the format or write the form. Uh, and then maybe someone else could solve it or you'd have a computer solve it. When these get to be three or four or five variables, they get really hairy and scary. Like think about last time you solved a three or four variable system, it probably took you a long time. Uh, and these have that same property also but at least being able to set it up, then maybe you can uh, find the system and have your calculator solve it or uh, you know some other method. So if I was gonna write the format of this, I'm still gonna split it into two fractions. Boom, boom. Uh, and I notice that I have two things here. I have both an irreducible quadratic but I also notice that it's repeated. And so I also have to use the rule about repeated factors from before. Write this on the line. So the first factor I'll write as x squared plus four on the bottom. And the second factor I'll write as x squared plus four squared. So this square right here is because that was a repeated factor. Now, because it's an irreducible quadratic, when I write the tops, the numerators, I can't just write a and b, I have to write a x plus b. So on the top, I'm gonna write a x plus b, and for the second factor, I'm gonna write c x plus d. Now, if I were to go and solve this out, we'd have four variables we need to solve for, a, b, c, and d. Uh, we might be able to find one or two of them easily, but then we probably in the end have to create a system with two or three variables and solve that out using our matrix and our calculator or solve it by hand. These can take a long time. I think they're kind of fun, but they can take a long time. So uh, here I just wanted to show you the setup. So we had a repeated factor again because we had a two. We put that two there because we had a repeated factor. And because this has been irreducible quadratic, when I wrote the numerators, I had to write it as ax plus b and cx plus d. Okay, uh, I want to now go to an exercise that I have borrowed from your textbook that's called Correct or Incorrect, that asks you to look at a bunch of different expressions and setups and decide, are these set up correctly or are they set up incorrectly? And uh, let's do it two at a time so it's a little bigger on the screen. And what I'd like you to do right now is pause this video, go back and look at your notes, go back and look at what uh, you've read in the book and everything you've learned about these, and decide, are these set up correctly or incorrectly?
If they're set up incorrectly, please fix them. So pause the video right now and see what you can do. All right, and you're back. So uh, this first one, I hope you said it was set up correctly. That is because we have two single factors down here. So they just written over here. And because they're not quadratic factors, we have an A and a B. So this is all correct. The second one, however, is set up incorrectly. And the key thing that uh, this person missed when they were setting it up is that two right there. Since this is a repeated quadratic factor, the second time that they write that factor out, they have to put an exponent of two there. If they had put that two there, then everything else would be set up just fine. Uh, so here's problems three and four. I would like you to pause the video again, uh, take a second and think about these, see if you can identify if they're correct or incorrect, uh, and then come back in a little bit and press play again. Welcome back. Uh, so let's take a look at these. So this first one is set up incorrectly. And the reason why is that this x squared plus four is a quadratic factor, which means when we write its numerator, we can't just write plain old b, we have to write b x plus c. Now it's not a repeated quadratic factor. There's only one copy of it. There's no exponent on the outside. So I don't need to do anything like that. All right, and number four. Is this set up correctly or incorrectly? This one looks to be set up correctly. We have an irreducible quadratic here. Uh, x squared plus x plus one, try to factor it, doesn't factor, but it is repeated. So when the factor is repeated, you need a second copy of it with an exponent of two. And because it's an irreducible quadratic, you need to have ax plus b and cx plus d on the numerators. All right, and for our last problem today, uh, what I'd like you to do is take a look at this, write it down in your notes, decide what scenario it is, set it up correctly, and then solve it out. So again, pause the video right here, give that a shot, and then uh, press play when you're ready if you wanna check your answer. All right, so the first part of this thing is getting just the setup, not even doing any solving. Uh, your first move should be to factor the bottom. Once you factor the bottom, you can pull out an x and you notice that you have an x squared minus four. Now above in the video, we did a lot with x squared plus four, but x squared minus four does factor. It factors into x plus two and x minus two. It's that difference of squares pattern. Uh, we notice that there's only one of each of these and none of them are quadratic. They're all linear factors. So I'm going to make three fractions, one, two, three, put one of those letters each on the bottom, uh, and then just write A, B, and C up on the top. And again, uh, maybe pause right here if you want and try to solve this out now, uh, if you didn't quite get there before, and we'll see where you're at in just a little bit. Okay, so the first step in solving this is going to be to clear out every fraction. To do that, you should multiply by the common denominator of all the terms. So x, x minus 2, x plus 2. When you bring that over to the first term, everything will cancel, and you'll just get 2x squared minus 18x minus 12. Bring it over to the second term. The x will cancel, and everything else will stay. So I'll get a, x plus 2 x minus two, bringing it to the third term. The x uh, plus two will cancel, but I'll have b x x minus two, and bringing it to the last term, the x minus two will cancel, and you'll have c x x plus two. Uh, now what you should do is uh, take a second and maybe, well, there's a couple paths you could do here. So here's where I would take a second and strategize. You could either distribute out every single one of these terms and simplify and equate some coefficients, or you could think about testing a value to plug in. Now, it does seem like maybe if you test a couple values, we might be able to get a, arrive at an answer more easily. So let's test. What if x is equal to zero? And I'm choosing zero because I noticed that x and x both are here in these terms. And I also noticed that like those will zero out. So if x equals zero in this case, then I would have negative 12 would equal a times two times minus two plus uh, zero b plus zero c. So that really simplifies down to negative 12 equals negative four a. So three 
has to equal A. There's our solution. Uh, now let's see if we can test some other variables. What if X equals two? That's gonna be a little more awkward because I do have to now plug it in. So obviously if zero you can plug in, it's gonna be a lot easier. But if you can't plug in zero, then plug in something that will zero out other values for you. So if X equals two, then I'll have two times four minus 18 times two minus 12 equals uh, a times zero plus b times zero plus c times two times four. So that'll be eight c and this is And so we know that C is five. So I know A, I know C. Uh, now we can try to solve for B. Now I'm most of the way there using this method of plugging in X's. So I'm just gonna plug in the X that zeroes out the last term, uh, X equals minus two, and that should let me solve for B. So if X is minus two, then I'm gonna have two times four uh, minus 18 times minus two minus 12 equals zero A plus uh, b times minus two times minus four plus zero c. So this is gonna be eight b. And on this side, it's gonna be eight plus uh, 36 minus 12. So that comes out to 32 equals eight b, which means that four was equal to B. And so to put all those answers back in, uh, we said A was 3, so we have 3 over X. We said B was 4, so we have 4 over X plus 2. And we said C was 5, so we have 5 over X minus 2. And of course, if you wanted to check your work, it might take a little while, but you could take those three fractions, add them back up with a common denominator, and you should, in theory, get as your, your combined numerator 2x squared minus 18x minus 12. So that is, uh, here, I'll just put all the work on one page so you can see it. That's how you would solve something like this with the uh, par uh, partial fractions method. And that's it for today. Uh, please email me with any questions you have. Uh, I hope you've learned something. Don't forget, you can also read through the examples in your textbook, uh, look at other resources online, um, or, you know, ask me or ask a friend. So that's all. You've been watching ECMATH. Have a nice day.